Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the council. Um, as the mayor said, our first item tonight is our uh, 2021 state legislative policy. It's been our custom the last several of years uh, to develop some staff recommendations of what would be fitting for that legislative policy to present that to the council in a study session, uh, make sure you think we are on the right track and then bring a resolution to the council formally adopting that. Uh, which we're tentatively planning to do at the uh, December 7th City Council meeting. So uh, this evening, our legislative liaison, Mr. John Mayfield, is here to give you a review of that proposed policy. Mr. Mayfield. Thank you, Mr. City Manager, Madam Mayor, members of the Council. I'm John Mayfield, Constituent Services and Legislative Affairs Officer for the City of Independence. Good evening. As the City Manager said, I'm here to present the 2021 proposed state legislative policy we have worked with staff, the city manager's office, and our two lobbying teams to put this proposal together. And as the city manager mentioned, it's our intention to have the final version on the council agenda on December 7th for your final consideration. The General Assembly will, the 101st General Assembly will convene on Wednesday, January 6, 2021. It'll be here before you know it, trust me. Legislators will begin the process of pre-filing bills beginning December the 1st. And you'll be receiving detailed emails from both of our lobbying teams about these bills as they're pre-filed throughout the month of December. And you'll also receive a regular update from our lobbying teams on the legislative activity beginning in January through the end of the legislative session in May. We have four top legislative priorities that we have identified for the city in 2021. So I'll go through them and kind of talk just briefly about a little bit about each one of them. If you have questions, if you want to interrupt me while I'm going on, that's fine. If you want to wait till the end, it's totally up to you. But I'll dive right in. The first one, in the interest of public safety, the city supports legislation to reinstate the authority of municipal governments to suspend in-state driver's licenses for failure to appear or failure to pay fine for traffic violations. <laughs> As some of you know that have been on the council for a while, the state passed municipal court reform in 2015 and 2016, which really hampered our ability to uh, get people to comply and come in and plead their case in front of the municipal court or pay their fine or set up a payment plan. Um, we estimate that two thirds of our traffic violators do not appear in municipal court and they get a bench warrant. And the municipal court reform basically said, well, you can't confine someone for failing to pay their traffic violations. And we have 99 miles of highway that our police department patrols in the city of Independence. That's a lot of highway to patrol and when people know that there aren't any consequences for their actions, you know, we are really left in a bad situation. I mean, we have people that, you know, continually to get tickets. They don't take care of them. Uh, the state require, requires us to give them a payment plan. Uh, this is really in the interest of public safety. If there's not consequences, people continue to do, you know, bad things over and over again. And this has been a top priority for the city for a number of years. Uh, last year, we were actually able to get it in a bill that made it to the governor's desk. Unfortunately, the governor vetoed it. There were other things in the bill the governor did not like, so he vetoed it. This year being the session of COVID-19, not a lot of bills were passed, so, but we're hopeful uh, for better prospects in 2021. Secondly, the city opposes any reduction in the cable franchise fee. In the 1980s, cable companies and cities negotiated a deal where basically the cable companies were allowed to uh, put their structures in the city, right, city rights of way and did not have to get easements. And in exchange for that, they would pay a cable franchise fee. And City of Independence received a 5% cable franchise fee. Each percentage is about roughly $270,000. So we estimate our, our cable franchise fee brings in about $1.3 to $1.5 million annually. And that's used and the general fund, and it funds things, police, fire, snow removal, street uh, improvements, and so forth. And um, this would be a big hit to our general fund if we lost this. And I can tell you up until the last hour of the session last May, we were fighting against the cable franchise fee reduction. And it is something we will have to fight again in 2021. Uh, the third item, the city supports wafer legislation, which will allow the city of Independence to collect the voter approved use tax on sales from vendors that do not have a nexus or physical location in Missouri. In June 2018, the U.S. Supreme Court made a decision in wafer versus South Dakota that kind of overturned a 1992 Supreme Court decision, Quill versus North Dakota, 
1992, the court said, well, you have to have a physical location in the state, the business does, to actually be able to collect the sales tax. And then in 2018, as the internet came along and Amazon and other companies came along and online sales became a much bigger deal in our society, the Supreme Court said, no, they don't necessarily have to have a, what they call a, a nexus or physical location in your state uh, to collect a use tax. Now we have a use tax currently that we're able to collect on sales from folks who already have a location here in Independence, but this would allow us to collect a sales tax on a sale from a vendor, maybe, for example, Washington State. Say there's a bat company in Washington State and they don't have a warehouse or a building or any tie to Missouri, they sell me a commemorative baseball bat for me to give my nephew for Christmas. I don't pay sales tax on it or use tax on that. Even though the sales are occurring here, uh, whoever delivers that to me is using our, our roads and our police and fire protection, but they still they don't have to pay. And what that does is it hurts our local businesses. I have had local businesses tell me over the last several years, they've actually had folks come into their stores, get out their cell phone, take a picture of something, Google it and find it online and buy it for a few cents cheaper because it was online and they didn't have to pay a sales tax or use tax. So our brick and mortar stores, I'm sure would be very supportive of this, of us doing this as well. And finally, the last thing, this is a little more wordy than I probably should have written it, so I apologize for that. The city supports local control of rights of way and public assets. Local jurisdictions need authority to set reasonable and predictable application processes and fees for the deployment of wireless facilities, including small cell pole attachments. You might remember Tom Robbins from Strategic Capital came and talked at the end of August about a bill that was passed in 2018. And basically what I'm saying here is at a bare minimum, we wanna be able to de defend the things we got in that bill, including the second highest uh, cell pole attachment fees in the nation. In a sense, power and light poles, there was no cap on fees with them and that we were able to retain some zoning over uh, wireless facilities in single family neighborhoods and historic districts. So at a bare minimum, we want to defend that as he, Mr. Robbins said, AT&T had 15 lobbyists working on their behalf. We have a short-term truce uh, with the telecoms, but you know that's a short-term truce and we're looking at the bare minimum to maintain what we have. And if there's opportunities to get an even better deal, we would be eager for that. Quite honestly, we probably had the best deal we're going to get. And if a peace treaty, if you will, were offered, I mean, I think we would have to consider that strongly. So at a bare minimum, we want to defend what we have. And if there's opportunities to get a better deal down the road, then we would actually like to take advantage of that. So those in a nutshell are the four state legislative priorities that we've put together for 2021. Not to say that there aren't other situations may come about and give us opportunities to get uh, legislation passed that's beneficial for the city and for our citizens. But these are the four main ones that we've identified and I think that's all that I have. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer your questions the best I can. Okay, are there any questions from the council? Madam Mayor? Yes. Um, Mr. Mayfield, just so I'm clear, mm -hmm. items one, two, and three will be John Barget and company's job. No, no, and number item number four is strategic capital's job. Is that correct? Uh, no, uh, actually numbers one and three will be um, John Barger and Associates. Numbers two and four will be strategic capital. The reason why uh, strategic capital is doing number two for us is this tends to end up, these bills tend to end up in front of the utilities committees in the House and the Senate. They handle and track a lot of utility legislation for us and have built relationships with the chairs of the House and Senate utilities committees. And that is a, a good fit for them. They've been working on that with us and dealing with the cable companies and their lobbyists for several years. So that's kind of why they have been handling that. And so Barger and Company and Tilly and Company know their jobs under one, two, three, and four. We shared this uh, document with them, I believe in October the 15th. And once the council adopts this officially, it will again be shared with them as well as our local state delegation. Okay, I just wanna be clear that Everybody knows what we're getting for our $240,000. Thank you, sir. Thank you, any other questions for John? Madam Mayor. Yes. 
John, on, under the Wayfair legislation, from what it reads here, that is something that could be simply, I say simple, that just needs to be passed by the General Assembly. That doesn't have to be moved forward to a statewide vote. My understanding is if the legislature passed, and it depends on what they decided, but what my understanding is, as I stand here tonight, that if they were to pass legislation saying that you could do that, we've already passed a, uh, a use tax by our voters, so that would, my understanding is it would go into effect for us. I don't believe it would be a statewide vote. I would have to double check with our city attorney just to make sure, or our lobbying teams. That's my understanding that if it were to be passed, and the only two states that currently don't have that are Florida and Missouri. Right. 40 out of 50 states have it. Thanks. Thank you very much. There's no more questions. Thank you. Hey. All right, I uh, have a little communication problem. Let us uh, move on to number two, Mr. City Manager. Yes, sir. Um, the uh, next presentation we have is an update on the Land Clearance Redevelopment Authority. This is an initiative our local uh, Independence Chamber of Commerce has been taking a look at uh, over the last several months. Um, are going to be a couple of speakers tonight to um, have a dialogue with the council about this. But first and foremost, we'd like to welcome Mr. Tom Lesnick, President of the Independence Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Mr. Walker, and good evening, Mayor Weir and members of the council. As uh, Zach said, I'm Tom Lesnick, President of the Independence Chamber of Commerce. Uh, tonight we want to have a conversation with you about um, the Glam Clearance Redevelopment Authority. Uh, in your packet, you should have had a little history on this, uh, as it was passed by voters back in 1957. Uh, it was used in a number of different ways over several years, but kind of became dormant in the 1970s. And uh, we think there's an opportunity there to maybe help with redevelopment here in Independence going forward. Uh, some background, about a year ago, the Chamber Board of Directors um, kind of looked at housing as a potential priority for our community, something that uh, obviously uh, is it important to growing the economy, uh, to, to growing more people in our community. And uh, they established a committee uh, we call um, Quality Housing and, and uh, Safe Neighborhoods. Uh, the committee has been meeting for the last year talking about different things we can do as, a, as an organization and as a community to kind of encourage uh, um, housing within our community. Obviously, there's a, there's a number of tools in the toolbox that are out there uh, LCRA, as it's often referred to, is, is one of those many tools, and uh, we feel like it's something that has potential for redevelopment. As you look across independence, especially the older parts, uh, there's areas where we see homes that are unoccupied, that are abandoned, uh, lots that are too small for, for development, but possibly could be combined with, with other sites um, to encourage new development. As many of you know, um, especially in Northwest Independence, I don't think there's been very many new houses since the 1950s built. Uh, certainly Councilman Perkins is aware of that and we think there's a lot of opportunity. We've come a long ways with housing, I think in the last few years and I think there's even greater opportunities moving forward. So tonight I wanna to give you a quick introduction. We have several members of the committee here. The committee is made up of a variety of, uh, of chamber members uh, in the real estate profession, uh, in, in professional business and other services. Uh, it's very diverse. Um, but tonight we're gonna give you a little background on LCRA, kind of how we see it moving forward. Uh, I'm gonna introduce our first speaker, um, which is Jim Allen. Jim is a member of the committee. Uh, he'll be followed up by Steve Maurer. Steve Maurer is a attorney here in the region, very familiar with our LCRAs, how they work, how they're governed, um, and some of the successes he's seen around the area and the communities he's worked with. So I'll introduce Jim Allen. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Thank you, Tom, very much. Uh, I get the honor 
of kind of giving you guys a little bit of background about our committee, right? So uh, first I'll start off and let you know uh, at 40, soon to be 46 years old, I'm a lifelong member uh, or lifelong resident of Independence. Grew up about a block and a half off Truman and River. Uh, went to Bryan Elementary, went to now what was Palmer and Chrisman. Been here my whole life. I've got family members that own businesses in this area. When it was time for me to open my first business, almost four years ago now, there was only one place I was gonna open it, and that was in Independence. Uh, so that's the short story of me. The, the committee was formed, uh, like Tom mentioned, to take a look at particularly the west side, but really, frankly, all parts of Independence, so that we could address areas that are underserved, that have got what the committee has started to call missing teeth, those, those areas that have got blight, that have got properties, that have got out-of-state owners, that have got landlords that have let these properties go defunct, that we have a hard time chasing, that the neighbors complain about, yet we don't have any real right to any of this property. We're taking a look at some of these neighborhoods and trying to find an opportunity so that we can help developers come in and enhance these neighborhoods. A couple of the initiatives of our committee that we talk about is the fact that, one, we wanna to try to target the mayor and the city's target of raising our household income. So we've got, we've got a lot of areas, particularly again on the west side of the city, that give an opportunity for, let's say, starter homes. Homes that are really wonderful, nice area for a younger family with children to move in close to a close to a school that they attend, close to a church that they attend, close to family members. Yet as that family develops, as that family grows, as they grow their personal average income, the opportunities for them to stay in some of those areas isn't as great. We're, we want to keep those families that love independence like I do and grew up here, that wanna start businesses here, that wanna go to work here, that wanna shop here, keep them in our neighborhood. Let's give them a better opportunity and better places, quote unquote better, but as they continue to strive, if there's a home, right now we've got record mortgage rates, I don't think that's a secret to anybody. People are aspiring to buy a little bit more homes, a little bit better homes. Let's keep them here. The LCRA is one opportunity that we have found that can help do that. The fact of the matter is we can help raise that average median income. We can help improve our school taxes. Dr. Hurl, I'm sure, would be impressed with the idea that there's gonna be no taxpayer money to support this, but you can, add, you can increase the average income of those home sales, you can, add, you can increase the average income of those families that live here to send schools to our independent schools. You get less transient population, you get people that really wanna put down roots in these neighborhoods and give them an opportunity to build a home in these neighborhoods that we know don't have that now. So that said, I'd like to introduce Steve Maurer. Steve has been in, uh, intimately involved with LCRAs in the past, can answer some very specific questions about how this process works. One thing that I wanna make very, very clear to this process is that it's a very targeted approach. It is not coming in and wiping out an entire neighborhood it is not displacing families. It is not asking people to move out of homes that we can then build you know, something that we've deemed fit that they thought was fine before. It is absolutely not about that. It is an extremely targeted approach so that we as a city, you as council members can help us address a very, very specific problem in very, very specific neighborhoods and very, very specific properties so that we can encourage developers to come in, develop these properties, improve that specific property, fill the gaps in these neighborhoods, improve the overall health of these neighborhoods, and help restore particularly the western half of Independence to what it used to be. So with that, I'm gonna turn the podium over to Steve.
Good evening. It's been a while. It's good to see everybody. Um, first of all, disclaimer, I'm not here as, this, as an attorney for the City of Independence, and I'm not an expert on a formation of an LCRA or everything else to the Nats eyelash. So if you have questions, I'll do my best, but that caveat, I have not done great research into the particular aspects of your existing LCRA. I think I know the answer, but I have that for you. But I want to step back a minute, just let you know, I know most of you know me, but if, if you don't, Western Independence has been near and dear to my heart, helped work for the school transition to bring Western Independence into the Independent School District, and have worked very hard to try and redevelop Western Independence to bring that new vital life that we have on the eastern half here to Western Independence. And the only way we're gonna do that is if we can create a much better mix of housing stock. And as Jim explained, you all have done a great job revitalizing our community, bringing in better jobs, raising the median income of our community. But if you want those people to stay, they have to have a nicer place to live because that's one of the things you're gonna want. If I'm making more money, I wanna have a nicer house. I wanna have a bigger house. Those opportunities don't exist very much in Western Independence. They're just not there. What are the challenges to bringing that? <clears throat> Any redevelopment has many problems. You have absentees, property owners, and so you have blight next to a house that I might want to redevelop. Or you have narrow lots, lots that are too small to build the kind of home that people want to live in today. So you need to be able to acquire both lots and assemble them, or maybe four and build two or three. So you need, some, you need to have the ability to acquire land. You need to have the ability to clean title. One of the best things that an LCRA can do or other development tool like this is you can clean title. So if I have to condemn property or I take, I take ownership of it as the LCRA and once it's owned by a governmental entity, I can transfer it on and the title's clean because I cut off anybody's ability to come back and say, oh no, that person you bought it from didn't have all the clean title. They forgot to establish a single heir. They forgot to provide notice to this potential claimant. I can cut that off. And so I can then, for a title company and a bank who's gonna give a mortgage on this new house, I can give them title that they're willing to accept and rely upon and take. That is a very important thing that an LCRA can do for redevelopment parcels. We can also assemble property. We can have two owned by a developer that we would wanna do, but you know what, there's one in the middle. And it's a blighted piece and we can't figure out who they are, we don't know where they're at, or they're not responding, or you know they're getting $200 a month in rent and that's just okay with them because they've never put a nickel into this old house and so we're fine with that. We can acquire that, and LCR has the authority of eminent domain, has the authority to buy property, and so you can clean that up and get the whole property for an assemblage, which would then allow for a new residential development. So that's what the L LCRA would be best for independence. What is the LC what the LCRA is not? It is not a commercial development redevelopment tool. No one is suggesting that you ought to use your LCRA to take out old commercial buildings and put up new. No one's suggesting that you ought to do, you know, a path of five miles long with your LCRA. This is, that is not what the LCRA is best used for. You have lots of other much better tools for that. You can do a TIF, you can do a NID, you can do a SID, you can do a TDD. There's lots of other things that are far more financially viable than an LCRA for that. But if you do reactivate your LCRA, you get to decide what you're gonna do with it because you can decide where it can be used. You can decide the work plan for how it's gonna be used. You can decide how much power you want to give to the five people that would sit on your LCRA board. You could decide for them that, for example, there, I'm gonna limit your acquisition of property to no more than three pieces per project. Or you could say, Unless the developer owns an adjacent piece, we're not gonna let you come in and use eminent domain on another parcel. You could do a lot of things to limit the impact or the potential detrimental impact of an LCRA if you so choose. Or you could always wait, get it started, see how it works, and then if you think you need to make adjustments, you can make adjustments to the work plan. So you have the ability to tailor it however you want. But what the Chamber of Commerce is suggesting is this is a tool 
that could particularly help in Western independence, all of independence, but particularly Western independence, to fill the gaps, to help provide a development tool for redevelopment of residential properties. One other thing, funding. So where does the money come from? The best LCRAs I've ever worked with don't do any project unless the developer has the money up front to get it done. So in other words, you're not out there speculating on property, hoping to find somebody that will come in and redevelop. How the best LCR, LCRAs work is there's an empty lot and I own the house next to it and I want to tear them both down and clean them out and build one new house. So will you LCRA help me because I can't get the owner of that property to respond to me or I can't find them because the tax records are so old they're not paying. And so I need to get that property acquired and I need to be able to clean them out and assemble them together. That's what an LCRA can do. And how you handle that is, sure, we can do that, but we know that to process that through and to get it all done, it's gonna cost $5,000. So if you give us the $5,000 in advance, we'll go do it for you. And the best LCRAs, when they work, the developer's happy to do that. You've just cut my work in half and saved me a lot of money. Um, if they can't stroke a check for whatever the LCRA decides it's gonna cost, you've probably separated out the reals from the pretenders and you've saved everybody a lot of time and heartache. The other best LCRAs that I've worked with have an appointed board. You have five, five citizens, have to have been in your city for more than five years, but it's done by a separate group, not by the elected officials for two reasons. First of all, it gives them the freedom to focus on the task you've given them. You have one discrete issue, one job to do, you go do it. The other thing is, it takes the pressure off you all because if, if a project gets politically charged for one reason or somebody wants to politically charge it, you don't have to, it's not mine. It's the LCRA board, you go deal with them. So uh, that separation makes it a lot easier for everybody to stay in their lane. The LCRA has to do one thing, they meet when they're needed, they can do, and they can focus on a project and they can get it done. So that's generally what an LCRA does and what we envision it would do but some of the projects that you have done in the past, I think you got a memo about that from your city administrator, Mr. Walker. Um, the city manager identified you know, some of the projects that would need to be addressed and need to be done just to clean them up. But those big projects are nothing of what the chamber envisions for this new renewed LCRA. They're looking for very small, discrete opportunities to fix a block, fix a three homes next to the school and then start that redevelopment process. Anything I've missed? Or did I cover everything? Any questions that we can answer? Yes. Uh, on the uh, on the tear down cost, we already have money. You know, we put out for blight, and everything else. And we can't tear that, these down. Where were you talking about getting the money to tear these down if the city uh, acquired them uh, to tear down? The the LCRA would not ask any money from the city for teardowns or property acquisition. The only way it would work is if the developer comes to the LCRA and says, I want to acquire and tear down that piece of blighted property and here's the cost that it's gonna cost the LCRA to get that done. So whatever money you have to identify for properties that you want cleaned up, that you wanna take care of, the LCRA is not crossing paths, we're not reaching in to take any of that money. It's only if the developer who wants to acquire the property can stroke that check. So on these ones that you can't get a hold of, I assume you're gonna do a ghost title? Yes, we would clear the title. Most likely we'd clear it through eminent domain. Okay. All right. so I have anyone else? Yes, I have some. Steve, when you talk about eminent domain, I think of the Santa Fe TIF. When you talk about urban renewal, I think about how we mess messed up the square. Those are not key words that delight my heart. Why should I, as an elected official of the 117,000 people here, delegate my responsibility? Because it is my responsibility on whether or not eminent domain is declared. Because eminent domain is I'm taking that piece of property whether you like it or not. Why should I do that? 43 years ago, somebody said it was a bad idea. Why is it a good idea today? 
Um, sorry, you can't see me smiling. I know, I know. <laughs> the eminent domain um, has a bad rap. Eminent domain certainly is not a pretty buzzword that people like to talk about. But, just so you know, because I was there and did it, without eminent domain, you wouldn't have the power and light, you wouldn't have the Sprint Center, you wouldn't have the racetrack in KCK, you wouldn't have H&R Block downtown, you wouldn't have Nebraska Furniture Mart. I mean, all of those things were done with eminent domain. But the project that you're talking about on the square was a commercial project. That's not what we're talking about. The projects that you've identified, the Santa Fe TIF, were not small, discreet, urban renewal, resi residential projects. I think the <coughs> answer to your question really is, when you revise the work plan for the LCRA as to what the LCRA board could do, you would establish what kinds of things could they use their power for. If yes. it's deemed appropriate to condemn a lot that's vacant and the taxes haven't been paid for three years, and you think that that's okay, you bet. Then put that in there and then let them do that. But aren't those properties already taken care of with the land trust? I mean, why are we doing this? We're doing this because if, if you're a developer trying to work with the land trust and wait for the land trust to get all of their processes done and everything to jump through and to get their attention to focus on the one lot that you want, good luck. The LCRA would be, look, I want this lot, I, it's, not, it's of no value to anybody, it's not helping the city, it's a detriment to the city, and I'm willing to pay whatever you want to charge in order to get it in clean title to transfer to me so that I can remedy your problem. Couldn't the developer go directly to the land trust? That's what I'm not understanding. We are, we are putting another artificial board in between the citizen who owns the property and a developer who wants the property. Right now, we have a land trust that will go ahead and take the property, right? Uh, not by, no? not necessarily. They're not gonna come in and just acquire. Would that happen? I'm sorry, Steve. It's okay, go ahead. Um, only under certain conditions does the land trust come in and um, take over that property, which is generally abandoned property. Um, you know, like, it truly abandoned. Um, so, yes, I mean, there we do have um, ability through the land trust to connect them with developers or other property owners who may be interested in acquiring property. But this it, that doesn't include everything um, in our city um, in the land trust. Um, so, I I mean. As Mr. Maurer said, one option is to appoint a board. The other option is to allow the city council to be the board. Um, and, you know, I think that that's something that would, you know, we would need to certainly consider and discuss. Um, I know Steve um, and I have talked about LCRA for a number of years. I looked back on my notes and um, as recently as January of 2019, we started looking um, to see about utilizing this tool. And it's, you know, there's certainly a lot to understand um, about it, but we also have with our um, partners with the Independence Chamber of Commerce, the ability to really write this the way that we see best fit for our community. And as both Jim and Steve have said, you know, we can write this as narrowly as we are comfortable with to ensure that it is used uh, properly in our city. Steve, can we not give them eminent domain authority? Give or is, can, can we say, yes, we'll go ahead and have this special board, but that board does not have eminent domain authority. Can we do that? Off the top of my head, I don't know why you could not. Okay. But in all candor, if you did that, you would really be hamstringing the LCRA because most of the properties, I did 11 city square blocks in downtown Kansas City when we completely redid for Power and Light, for the H&R Block building, and for the Sprint Center. But of those 11 city blocks, there were over I don't know, 130 different property owners, 
400 and some par individual parcels. I actually went to trial for three because mo the vast majority of those were worked out because once they were contacted by, in that case, it was the TIF Commission, and they knew that we had the power of eminent domain, then we finally got them to negotiate with us and come up with a price because you're not going to be able to just say no. If you push me far enough, I can make that happen. And so it became the prospect of having a deal. You got a deal done and we moved it down the road. Now, I didn't have anybody ever come back and say, oh, what you paid me wasn't fair. Now, and I only had to condemn three through trial. That's just how it works. And so if you limit them, you're gonna take away that ability to say, look, you might as well deal with me because eventually if I need to, I can take it. Um, you know, it's not nearly as an effective LCRA. But in all candor, I don't think you're gonna have a lot of c adverse condemnation like we might have had otherwise. Most of the eminent domain that you'd be talking about here would be to clean title. I'm gonna file against this property because it's an absentee person and I can't even find them and that's how I'm gonna wash the title. And if you take away my ability to do that, then I can't clean the title and pass it free and clear to the, the ultimately the bank that's gonna issue a mortgage on it. I have a question. I think, you know, I, I'm with you that we've gotta find ways to raise a medium income in this city. If we're gonna grow, we've gotta have a good, you know, aligned economic development policy, community development, real estate's key. Um, I'm wondering, uh, just for those who need something visual, uh, can you give us maybe a city not far from us that has, has, uses this type of program, has successful uh, results as it? I did work for the city of Kansas City. Okay. And they, they have an LCR. They have many, many economic development tools, but they, they have, a, a, at the time, had a very active LCRA. And I worked with the Kansas City LCRA and as one of the many entities that they had. And I thought they did a fine job. And it stayed in its lane, partially because it had lots of other, uh, other avenues that it could use for um, other development opportunities. Mm -hmm. So you can't say it's a pretty big area. Can you give us, can you be a little more specific where I'm they're using it? I think we did some we did a project down off of Paseo. Um, we did a project like, um, it's been a few years, like 63rd and Troost, if I recall. It was all urban renewal projects and it was, you know, essentially we took out um, what were old hotels that had been converted and things like that and we transformed them into new, in that instance, we transformed them into multifamily housing that were considerably an upgrade. I think we also did some, if I remember, I, I'm getting my various entities, which jurisdiction we use, but we did a bunch around the 18th and Vine also, okay. that we did part of that with the 18th and Vine Development Authority, and I think we used LCRA on some of the others to clean up some of the other parcels around there. Yeah. Lee Summit's another example. Yeah. Lee Summit, okay. Lee Summit used, I've never done any work for them, but Lee Summit has, I believe they've done quite well, they're, a bit. They're a pretty good example. Absolutely. Yeah. So, that's, I think I think uh, shared concerns can can be talked through, obviously. But I I do think we've got to really devise some strategies here to take care of our areas that are we hear people talk about so much. So, if if this is uh, one of the one of the tools that we can make work, I certainly think it's worth our the time for discussion. There's, there's a lot of scary terms, right? There's a lot of things that are very scary, like eminent mm -hmm. domain, mm -hmm. you know, council member Lucy. People don't like to hear those things. What this is aimed at, and the gist of what we're trying to do, and I want every one of you to hear me say this, is that it's very pointed. It is extremely, extremely important that people know we're not displacing families we are not wide sweeping blocks and gonna put up giant houses. We are making a neighborhood as good as it once was, right? There's an opportunity to make these, and frankly, better than they once were. 
there was a thriving part of our town that is falling apart. Let's call it what it is. There is a huge opportunity. The reason that the land grant maybe isn't the best choice, when does it last happen that a developer went to the land grant and found something? It doesn't happen because they can find cheaper alternatives to go other places to make money. A developer wants to make money. Maybe with the best intentions, but they want to make money. They need to make money. Profit's not a bad word. If we give them the opportunity to make money in our town, in the neighborhoods that can strengthen our city, that can strengthen those neighborhoods, that can return better taxes to our schools, that can invite people to move from that starter home that's a two, a two bed, one bath, to a four bed, two bath, because gosh, we outgrew it, but we love this school, we love the area, we love this church, we love being close to the square, that's what we're doing. It's extremely pointed. It's extremely specific. We're not, again, I'll say it again, looking to destroy blocks. We are not looking to displace families and homes. We're absolutely looking at opportunities to invite developers in to be partners with the chamber, with the city, so that we can develop our town to improve our tax base, to improve our average median income, to improve the livelihoods of those that want to live in our town instead of when they have an opportunity to move because they've bettered themselves and they don't see a house that fits them moving to Blue Springs or Lee Springs that have already done some of these things. Let's keep them here. Let's give them the opportunity to stay here in an area that's rich and that people love, but they don't see an avenue. And it's those vacant properties. It's those parts of town that don't have anything going on. Again, it's giving it, opening the door to somebody in an expedient fashion so that we can actually get things done before they move on and make money somewhere else as a developer. That's what this tool is at. And I can't stress enough that it is absolutely, you know, part of our job to figure out what the criteria are. How do we want to set this up? How do we want to make sure that the, it's set up so that it's best for us to do this right for us in our neighborhood? So yeah, there is some ugly wording and people shy away from those things, but that's not what this is about. It's absolutely about improving our neighborhoods and giving our residents a better opportunity. Sorry to interrupt. Oh no, it's all right. You said it better than I did. Mr. Maurer. Dan Hobart, yep. we've talked before, but yes. I don't believe we've met in person. You live in Manor Oaks, is that right? No, no, no. I don't. Nope. You rep do you represent the HOA? No, I, I don't think so. I can't remember what I ran into you from. <laughs> is that a bad thing? <laughs> <laughs> All right, must have been something else we were talking about along the way. Uh, so, and the city manager and I have talked a lot about this lately because uh, we have a real problem with rental properties that are vacant, that are unattended, and that are not maintained. Uh, we've got an ordinance coming up in a few weeks uh, that hopefully will pass that um, will allow us to start tracking that and putting some responsibilities on the property owners that have letting their let their property go vacant. Um, my understanding of this is that it was the LCRAs were initially uh, for urban renewal. And it's also my understanding that, that other programs like 353s that are also state statutory uh, programs uh, are almost sort of modeled after this as a way to help renew neighborhoods. They can, yes. I can tell you, and not that I need to tell you this, but uh, I could I could have a, a line of people uh, and I, that I've been to their neighborhoods in the fourth district that absolutely the problem house on the block is a rental. Uh, the vacant house on the block is a rental. Uh, we have an aging population. These folks have lived here literally for 40 years in the same house. They bought them when they were brand new, 50 years, 60 years, uh, and they are um, their people are inheriting these properties. Uh, they just move into the properties and they don't take care of them. I, to me, this is this is like a 
I'm so happy you guys brought this up because I didn't know anything about it beforehand. And it, it, it's like a it's like a shining star for me to think that we have a chance to clean up some of our neighborhoods. Um, so anyway, I appreciate you coming here and and all the folks from the chamber because I would. This will encourage home ownership and not rentals. It will encourage home ownership. It'll encourage redevelopment of properties. And the other thing it will do is it won't cost the city any money. It's not like the city's got to come out of right. pocket to buy these right. and clean them and then hopefully attract some developer to come and do it. It's not tips, and we're no. not issuing bonds, and we're not nope. there. It's a, it's a developer incentive to get lots and independence and do new construction. Okay. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Go ahead, Councilman. Thank you. So four years ago when, when I was elected, one of the things that uh, was on my agenda was to reduce blight and, and to stabilize, stabilize our neighborhoods and stuff. And our, our city budget was lacking um, drastically in that. And the council saw the wisdom to increase those budgets to remove the blight, which has led to some of the missing tooth uh, discussion that we have here. So this is just, in my opinion, another step, one more tool that we can have in our toolbox to help stabilize and acquire the property to, to make our neighborhoods a little bit stronger. So using um, you know, the blight definition, I mean, that would be something that's already established that we use as a city. So we wouldn't be creating blight, I mean, uh, a new definition. We'd be using a working definition that we're currently using now. Absolutely. Okay. Then, um, not to give the, the whole history of, of Fairmont and the northwest side of town, but a lot of those homes in, in lots were developed after World War II. They're very tiny, so if one was to go down and to build something there, wouldn't meet the setback requirements, the restrictions, and, and, and the like. So this would give the opportunity to acquire the different properties, and some of those properties are up there with land trusts now. So the ability to acquire two or three or four lots and building just one or two homes is a tremendous uh, value and benefit to using this. But the safeguards that, that we would have, the, so the city council would, to, would appoint, then the planning commission would review, so there would be one step of, of safeguardness there as well. Then let's say we establish this program three years, four years down the road, and we realize perhaps this isn't the way to go, dissolving that would not be a, a major problem. You can always change it and take it away. Right. For sure. So this would just be an, an extra added step in the toolbox. Yep. So, Mr. City Manager, as I'm bouncing down here, looking to the next step, um, are you looking for the direction from the council to to proceed with with the next steps of, of formulating the LCRA, or what? What's your thoughts? Yeah, you know, we're going to need at some point that direction. I think tonight certainly it's been a long time since the city utilized this as any kind of a development tool. So. First and foremost, I wanted to uh, give the chamber the opportunity to come and present to the council and um, bring this conversation uh, into that formal public realm. Um, I know the council probably will want to take a little time digesting this sure. and, and maybe conversing a little bit more about some of the nuances, but at some juncture, yes, we would need to make that decision if we want to reappoint that board. Um, uh, as Mr. Allen pointed out a few years ago, Lee Summit resuscitated this tool. Uh, that was in 2009. Uh, and first step there again was appointing a board, um, allowing the board then to put forward bylaws for council adoption and they were off and running from there. Um, so we would need to make a decision if that's something that this council wants to do. Um, but I know tonight was you know just that first blush to get this into the public realm. Sure, fair enough, thank you. And just one more point, uh, even though the LCRA is for residential, I'd remind uh, my colleagues that were on here and, and my new colleagues that um, the three-story building, the comprehensive mental health building in Inglewood, we had started those um, uh, eminent domain proceedings to bring that property owner into discussion, which ultimately led us purchasing, which um, is now moving forward with Inglewood Arts. So it was the same but different tool. It was just us as a city bringing and using uh, eminent domain as a possibility to bring that gentleman into uh, negotiation to acquire. So. This is one success story that we can we can mark using that process. Anything else? All right, that'll bring. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, that'll bring us to number three: Independence Council for Economic Development Update. Mr. City Manager. Yes, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, oh, 
Sorry. Excuse me. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, which is our president and CEO of our Independence Council for Economic Development, uh, Mr. J.D. Kerman, who's here to give his annual report uh, to the council. So I would like to make sure that everyone is aware we are doing some network updates on the um, internet that is causing some disruptions in our stream. That is why we keep losing the mayor. An uninterrupted video of this meeting will be put up on YouTube tomorrow morning. We are working with tech services to stabilize this as quickly as we can, but there are some very important systems that have been impacted, so they take priority right now, so. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, Mr. City Manager, City Staff, and guests. Uh, my name is J.D. Kerman. I am the President and CEO of the Independence Council for Economic Development, and I'm pleased to be before you this evening. I've come today with my Vice President, uh, Ms. Jody Krantz, who I want to recognize. Many of you may recognize Jody for her business retention efforts over the many, many years here in Independence, and our Vice Chair, Steve Maurer, who, who you've also uh, uh, just met. Uh, for the last couple of months, I started on June the 6th, and I've been asking people every day, what does it take to do business in independence? What does it take to get business done in independence? And I keep hearing the same things over and over again. And I've had conversations with some of you uh, about this issue, but I've identified what those three things are, and I think that you'll agree with me tonight. I, I'm here actually to walk you through our strategic plan. This is an important document for me and for my small staff because this is the document that tells us what my investors, the city, the school district, and the many private investors that we have, what they want to see and what their expectation is. The reason that I need to tell you about these three critical things that you need to have in order to be successful in independence is because really to understand this document, you've got to see how these things all fall under one of these three important categories and how many times all three are, are manifest themselves in a, in a, given, in a given issue. So, the things that I hear the most common are, are, are frustration with getting business done, frustration uh, with access, frustration with um, advocacy, frustration with expertise, not knowing who the, who the right players are. So the three items that we hear the most that a, a business says, I need this to be successful in independence, is they need expertise first and foremost. Expertise, not just in the traditional sense, legal expertise, uh, 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 business development expertise, but they also need expertise in guiding through municipal government processes. They may need expertise in business startup or, or, or regulatory matters, and the EDC is uniquely positioned to, to provide all that. In addition, they need access, and let's face it, many people complain that they don't know how to access their city council. They don't know how to access planning commission members. They may not know who to talk to at IPL. They may not know who to talk to at the county. Uh, one, of the, one of the great benefits of having somebody that spent the last 14 years in city government as the president of the EDC is that we now can add that to our set of tools. We know exactly where they need to go and what they need to do to get there. And finally, the advocacy portion cannot be understated. So much of the effort that is already taking place in independence simply needs an advocate from the economic development side. Uh, I've had conversations with a few of you who are working hard on community development projects workforce development projects, neighborhood projects, corridor projects, all of these things have an economic development component because they're not only creating new business, but they're also ensuring that there's going to be a pipeline of jobs now and in the future inside independence. So without spending too much more time, I wanna just run through quickly some of the broad uh, areas that we covered in this strategic plan, and then you can spend some time with it, and if you have questions or concerns in the future, we can speak about these some more. Under the organizational focus, once you move past our mission statement and our goals and our objectives, um, these are really our, our, that's really our sustainability plan. Uh, we, we're just like you and that money's tight and, and we need to manage what we have very carefully. Uh, so some of the same goals um, that you have, for example, increasing median household income, we want to do that as well, but we've also got some internal goals in terms of increasing revenue. Surrounding development, development of an industrial park, uh, a business park, construction, speculative industrial space. I'm sure this has probably appeared on the business plan every year that you all have been involved with the EDC. Um, evaluating existing properties, 
creating development ready sites, exploring regional market demand for things like refrigerated space, manufacturing, warehousing. Again, this is where you, you, not, you don't just need uh, business development or real estate expertise. It really helps to have community development and, and city government expertise. Uh, specifically, when I talk to some of the big boys that are in the Kansas City area, and they're looking, I mean, North Point, uh, 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 Occidental, those places, and they're looking for development ready sites or greenfield sites, it's helpful to, at the very front end of that deal, have somebody that's got some government experience to help make sure that they don't step over their own feet trying to get something through. And so we can really help create that red carpet experience as they move through the, uh, the process here in Independence, especially as they interface with uh, the city and the Planning and Zoning Commission, city staff, et cetera. Business retention and expansion, this has really been the heart of, I think, what the EDC has done for many years, and that's thanks to Jody Krantz, primarily. What you see here in, in, in these goals is the, um, looks like I'm advancing my slide and not the slide on the, when you, when you, when you look at the goals that are under business retention, well, I don't have it. So, really what we're talking about, creating and implementing business surveys, this is advocacy for what, what do you need right now following um, the COVID restrictions and things like that. The working with the Innovation Center graduates, we've graduated more than 80 businesses out of that Innovation Center, that business incubator, and we've got to make sure that they find a place in the community. The work ready community efforts, recertification, the, the coordination with the city's work 2025 program, these are all part of the retention efforts that we undertake every day. And in many cases, there are opportunities to not only help businesses uh, retain or expand their current workforces, but that experience creates almost an ambassador in that particular owner because uh, he or she then shares that positive experience with the other uh, peers in the industry. Under the section that we have called enhanced relationships, we're really talking about uh, that this is what, what I mean when I say access. Local school districts, local employers, KCADC, the Kansas City Area Development Corporation, uh, the city staff, the city council, uh, Englewood Arts District, the Fairmount uh, 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 Neighborhood Redevelopment Project, all of, these, all of these partners, all of these relationships that we form, this is what, what constitutes access for us. So that when we get a particular prospect or a particular client that's not sure where to go, we, we are plugged in somewhere with all of these efforts at, at every level inside independence. And it's those relationships and, and that, that are so crucial to my ability to, to provide access to people who, who want to get business done in independence. The investor engagement portion is, again, that's some housekeeping stuff for us. We, we need to build value for our investors, and they're hungry for information right now. They're hungry for expertise. They're hungry for market trends, and that's what we try to provide for them on an ongoing basis. And then finally, with the Innovation Center, this is probably one of the uh, greatest stories that the EDC and the city have to share in, in that we've got a real business incubator staffed by two experts that aren't only uh, just experts with, with regard to business startup, but uh, if you've got questions about FDA regulations, food handling regulations, all of the things that we're seeing a lot uh, of growth in with, with the entrepreneurs, I've got the experts at that innovation center to get it done. And even during the pandemic, even with all the restrictions in those kitchens, they still continue to graduate uh, businesses and, and, and help them land in the community. If there is a goal for the innovation center, it's that we want to get make sure that more of those graduates stay in independence. Some of them have migrated to Kansas City and things like that, but we want to grow them here and we want to keep them here. Uh, when, when the Innovation Center says they're a one-stop shop for business startup, that's really no joke. Um, and what we have found is that if you don't have the expertise, the access, and the advocacy in independence, you're going to be lost. You're going to spin your wheels, you're going to waste time, and you're probably going to waste money. So my, my takeaway that I want you all to think about it in terms of a call to action is that the EDC can help. We are specifically and uniquely positioned to help businesses move through these various phases of getting a business off the ground or starting a new development. I, I would ask that you don't wait and that you act now because we need to get to them as early as possible. Early intervention is the key. If you know of somebody that's having a problem, if you know of somebody that's got an interest in something or a property that maybe, let us at least take a look at it. Let us at least have a conversation with you. 
uh, because I think the earlier we can plug you in with resources, the earlier we can plug you in with expertise, and the earlier we understand what you're doing and we can become advocates for it, why then the EDC can make sure that you win, that you're the hero of your story. But we're here to guide people every step of the way, and I believe that we're uniquely positioned to do so. I want to thank you all for your time tonight, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Is there any questions for the council? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Mr. Kerman, I um, uh, how drilled down into some of these are you on specific details? I'm just curious what your not not mean to put you on the spot, but what's your plan to increase the revenues and to I mean, do you have a specific strategies in mind? Yeah, that? really the specific strategy. When I talk about these three things that businesses need, I, I think, you know, when I first came here, we were so <coughs> focused on let's tell the EDC story. Let's tell the EDC story. We need to tell the story. And testimonials are great. And we've got examples of businesses that, that you know, from infancy and, and until opening day, you know, were handled every step of the way by, by my vice president. And those testimonials are important. But when I say we're going to grow revenues, increase income, create better access to jobs. What, what I'm really talking about, especially when you talk about increasing median household income, is that I'm not here to tell you the EDC story. I'm here to tell you that I'm listening to what our business owners and our new prospects need, and they all are telling me I need expertise, I need access to the right players, and I need advocates. And so what does that mean in terms of uh, in increasing median household income, for example? If there are efforts underway uh, in uh, Englewood, uh, in, in um, Fairmont is a great example, that are, are saying you, you want to start business, you're looking for more opportunities, you're looking for uh, ways to, uh, to, to leverage uh, financing to, 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 to fix either your business or your home. Uh, all of these things are sort of the building blocks of what becomes a more, a more um, a, a vital economy that, 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 can, that can adapt to change and adapt to people transitioning maybe from poverty or below the poverty level to above. So when I say when I say we have a plan, the plan doesn't say that I'm going to go out and contact 500 people and ask them if you know how you know what what their salary looks like today versus yesterday. What we're going to do is we are going to address these core needs of our of our uh, prospects, and we're going to continue to work again with the efforts that are already happening because more than likely, the efforts for workforce development, the efforts for uh, alleviating uh, housing problems and things like that are already happening. You're, you're already doing them. And that's when the EDC can come to the table as advocates and possibly as, 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 as experts uh, in, in certain areas. I, I've got a lot of background with um, community-based projects and, and uh, community-wide health uh, initiatives, specifically with the Cerner Corporation for the past 10 years. And I really do believe that the key to things like stabilized household incomes, increased household incomes, it, it's really a combination, not just of new dollars and protection of existing dollars, but you've got to create and grow new opportunity. And that's what I see happening, especially in, uh, in, 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 in places like Fairmount and Englewood, where you're, you're literally cultivating uh, opportunity there at the, at the grassroots level. We, uh, as you know, uh, we had a big, uh, it's probably fair to call it a mess, with the proposed development by Van Trust on the east side of town, mm -hmm. and um, trying to take a, a thirty thousand foot view of that, it seems to me like that may hamper our uh, prospects a bit. I can't imagine Van Trust left with a good taste in their mouth, and I am concerned about that. That it's going to be hard for us to get grade A developments, light industrial, commercial. I know retail's not the way to go these days, really, but um, you know, I, I feel like we need to be aggressive if that's at all possible. Again, that's your job, but I don't know if you have an opinion on that, or I'm not trying to get you to weigh in on projects that didn't go, but. Councilman, I can tell you this, that uh, the Van Trust uh, uh, project and the aftermath uh, was obviously a watershed event for the city. It's, it's the number one issue people want to talk about when we first meet. Uh, and I can tell you that I do not see it as a hindrance. I see it as uh, a vehicle for, for, for d improved development. We all got smarter. We all got a little smarter. Good. Uh, even e even uh, if you weren't here, like, I, I mean, I, I, we, we all learned something here. Um, and I, I feel like the community learned something. Um, I'm still talking to those big players, not necessarily that one. 
but there are still large regional firms that are interested in, in, in independence and in working with independence. Are they concerned about what happened with Van Trust? Sure, they are. But they're not talking to an economic development guy solely. They're talking to a, to a guy with a background in city management. So it's, it's easy to address some of these fears at the outset. And, and again, all good deals start with a lot of hard work behind the scenes at the beginning. And that's where the EDC can really prosper. We have got to address those core needs before we're going to be able to serve uh, existing businesses and businesses coming in. And again, I'm going to say it so much, you're going to be sick of hearing it, but it's, they need expertise, they need access, and they need advocacy. And we can, we can provide all of those things. Somebody mentioned to me the other day that it's tough to get in the pipeline here, that it's tough to get in the pipeline. They meant the development pipeline. It doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be. We've got the keys to the vault. We know where all the bodies are hidden. We know how to get things done. We know where to go, who to talk to. Uh, if it's a business retention or startup question, we've got the expertise. If it's a government related or a land use question, we've got the expertise. The fact of the matter is my small team of four people can be a, uh, are going to have a huge impact on development. And uh, past issues, like the one that you mentioned, Councilman, uh, are, are not going to, uh, are, are not gonna hinder us, they're gonna serve us. Thank you. So. I had a question too. JD. I'm sorry, how, yes. Uh, how are you tonight? I'm good, thank good. you. Good, it's good <laughs> to see you. Um, I, I wanted to uh, just speak to the issue of the Van Trust. Uh, you and I have had conversations uh, with, with Council Member Huff, and we understand that whatever project that uh, may or may not be proposed out there, that we're going to handle it a lot differently and, and talk to the residents of the 3rd District, specifically in that area, or wherever there may be some conflict. So I commend you for your desire to want to work through some of the, the past that uh, was of no fault of your own and to work alongside of us to make sure that whatever we do um, out in that direction that you're committed to that process as well. When you said 80 uh, businesses been through, that's this year through the innovation? Uh, no, center? I believe that's total since their inception. Yeah, total, total business with established business graduates. Yeah. And how long has that been? When did they? Yeah, I, I beg your pardon. I don't. Uh, yeah, it's been. They've been around since the mid 2000s, I believe. Yeah. So. Okay. Before my time, I, be, I do know that we've got uh, 80 graduates that are out the door and still operating. Okay. So. And they are still operating. Yes, they're not all in independence, unfortunately, but we're right. working on that. What's the types of businesses that you're helping set up out there? Uh, you see a combination, a real, a kind of eclectic mix. If you're going to see manufacturing there, it's extremely small scale. Um, and so one of the more successful businesses that's still over there right now. Um, makes these uh, uh, pieces of, of, of t these timers for telecoms, and they have to work at, 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 at such a, 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 a severe tolerance and, and, and level that they're one of the only uh, groups that can seem to manufacture these things properly. Uh, they're in there, and, and of course their challenge is going to be you know, getting enough capital to move out. What you see more of over there are startup businesses, maybe uh, healthcare, somebody that may be uh, doing some kind of a um, real estate business. A lot of um, single person, sole proprietor type startups. We do have some sort of think tank atmospheres in there where you've got a number of people working in a room. As you recall, that's an old hospital building, so those suites are set up like laboratories, which means even during social distancing, people can really spread out if they need to. Mm -hmm. So you see a lot of those smaller businesses, and then obviously the real backbone of the innovation center are those kitchens, those commercial kitchens, the use of those kitchens. Um, whether or not somebody was launching a new business uh, and they needed access to the kitchen in order to launch their new business or if their business was starting to fail and they had to close their brick and mortar storefront or, or they were forced to close it rather uh, they were still able to come into that innovation center and at least put some model back to work and uh, my, my team over there uh, Xander Winkle who really deserves a, uh, a, a, a mention here have been extraordinary in somehow walking the line between the needs of these businesses who in many cases are brand new at what they're doing and the, um, the mandates that are coming down from the county in terms of what you can and cannot do in a kitchen. Uh, one, of the, one of the great things uh, about the Innovation Center is that every one of those businesses in there knows that Xander Winkle and Alex, his assistant, wake up in the morning thinking, what can I do for these people to make them more successful? 
Alex just, or, uh, Xander rather, just pulled in a $50,000 grant, CARES money. They're retrofitting the kitchen area in conjunction with the school district so that we don't have these bottlenecks that are, that are um, impairing use of that space. So, you know, there's a great uh, 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 example of how CARES money is being put to ch sort of change the environment inside that building to make sure that we can still push graduates out, push them through the program as quickly as possible. Excellent. I, just one more question. I know um, we've had some discussion on the hardships of small business in our community. Jody, in terms of business retention, is there anything that you would like to share in terms of what small businesses are telling you and their struggle during this pandemic? Okay. Yeah, and I do want to mention that when I, I know that you you've been very engaged, Councilman, with with some of the small business community here in Independence, and to the extent that we do hear a lot about utility rates, and so this this news that, that there's going to be some rate relief has has been really really well received. Um, the the other thing that I think we hear a, a, a great deal about is the is just the the kind of um, oh the the, the day to day. Uh, uh, problems that these businesses are having, just sort of um, understanding what the changing rules are. I mean, I guess this is no surprise, but I, I think there's a little confusion about what's next and what's next. And um, I think if you're a business person, if you're running a small business, you just don't have time to sit on the phone and run around and try to run all this information down. That's why we're here. Um, e even if you've got a small business and you've got a, a problem related to the city, you may not know where to begin. And that's, that's an easy call for us because we, we know exactly which staff member to plug you into. So what I would say is to the extent that these businesses don't have the time or the resources to waste being on the outside looking in, they need expertise, they need access, and they need advocacy. And w the EDC, is, it, it, that's our job. And that, that's, that's what we do for the businesses and independents because you all have, have charged us with that responsibility. So, well, and that, that'll continue. I appreciate that, and I, I think that this is a real opportunity, or maybe more discussion needs to go into the work-ready communities. You're talking about pursuant uh, recertification work. So work as, as we have, a, I'm sorry. Can you can you come up to the microphone real quick? Workforce and a train, trainable workforce is still very important to a lot of our businesses. There's still uh, businesses that right now are growing, adding employees, and uh, particularly in the trades, there's a real uh, void out there here and around the country, actually, of people that want to go into the trades, and that's what businesses need, um, particularly manufacturers. They have a lot of people in the older age categories going to be retiring, and a lot of the kids coming out now are not necessarily interested in that, but that's where the Career Academies program with ISD has us kind of a pretty much a step above just about anywhere around. That's good. Okay. Well, that that I hope that we can continue the conversation just to support you and what you're trying to do in our community with with businesses either coming or trying to keep them here or keep them alive. Mm -hmm. So if there's <clears throat> more that we can do, please reach out to us to be, be supportive great. of you too. Great. And you were talking about the Innovation Center before too. Some of the people that started in there when we were open, and maybe the first year, two years, they're still there. They don't have to leave. So everybody that's gone through there hasn't necessarily graduated into another location. Some of them are, it fits their needs, like the electronics company that JD was talking about. So they, they've been there for many years. Well, what I would mention, another great story about this is I, I found out that um, we were we were going to attend a service last Sunday at a church um, in, in uh, Northwest Independence called Revive, I believe it's called, and it turns out that that started through an innovation center. Now, not in the <coughs> innovation center, but it was Xander that helped that pastor with his business plan and his model, and, and you can see, so you've got somebody that specifically chose an underserved neighborhood because they wanted to be part of building it up. Um, and they, they needed the same thing everybody else needs, expertise, access, and advocacy. 
And, uh, you know, thank goodness, you know, I've got this team of superheroes in Xander Winkle and, 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 and Jody that they, they, know, they know how to plug these people in. They know how to get things done. So we will continue this, this work. And I do want you to, to know, to be confident in the fact that the EDC is seeing a lot of opportunity and in independence. We just need to make the most of it. So, Mr. Mayor Pro Chair, if I may. Go ahead. Councilman. I want to say this is a great step forward. This is a great path, kind of getting us back on, on track here, getting us moving to where we need to be. I want to say thanks to, to you and Jody and, and Xander for going down and, and meeting with Pedro uh, Zamora a couple of weeks ago with the uh, um, uh, Hispanic uh, Economic Development Council off of 24 Highway and a lot of the things that they were talking uh, he was talking about is how can we take the momentum that they've achieved there and bring it here in our Hispanic community with a lot of the capital outlay projects that are going to be moving forward. And we have the, fortunately for us, we have the time to, to build the community right and to get the right people in, in charge there. I wanted to say thanks for your willingness and your, your open uh, uh, door to get out there with me and kind of hear what some of the other ideas are so we don't always have to reinvent that wheel. It's out there. We just need to adapt it to what we have going on here. And one of the most um, uh, important things he was talking about with those stackable credentials that Councilman St uh, Stonemeyer was talking about with our workforce development, that was a key to their success and what they're doing there. So however we can help getting those credentials stackable and moving forward is we're here to help. Thank you very much. On the, um, the workforce uh, training and stuff, I met a gentleman over the weekend I was gonna bring to you that uh, up north uh, by the border up there for the state line uh, he was a high school advisor, and they managed to get a college up there that had been vacated, and they turned it into workforce training. And he said he would, you couldn't believe how successful it's being uh, with welding, electricians, and getting these people ready to go. Of course, there's windmills up there, so windmills was a big deal for them. But they're keeping their people up there. They got a lot of businesses coming in. And I talked to him a little bit about coming down and talking to you and Jody about maybe an extension off of that maybe give us some ideas. So I got his name and number for you. I'll get I'd that. be grateful for any context that any of you can provide. Certainly we, um, the, the workforce development issue like that, it's, it's great to be able to tell companies that we can, that we can staff them today, but we're looking for long-term sustainable economic growth. So they need to know that we can staff them tomorrow and the years and years after that. Sure. Absolutely. Thank Other you. questions. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your time. That'll bring us to the fourth one here, fiscal year 2022. I can't see these glasses here. Uh, the general fund financial forecast update. Sorry about that, city manager. <coughs> yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. I'm going to get my presentation queued up here. One moment, please. Okay, again, my name is Zach Walker, uh, your city manager, and tonight I'm going to give you a presentation that I know we previewed for the council at your annual strategic planning session back in October, but tonight we're going to roll this out a little bit more, and that's your five-year uh, financial forecast. Uh, this is important for a lot of reasons, but the biggest reason this is important is this is one of the deliverables in your strategic plan, Independence for All. And one of the big objectives there is that we improve our um, financial reporting, and part of that is improving our long-range financial reporting, so that the decisions that are made uh, by our councils today are <coughs> understood in their long-term financial impact for, for years to come. So tonight, again, I'll give you a quick overview of what we're uh, looking at with our five-year model. We'll talk about some of the major revenues at a very high level uh, that are in this assumption, some of the key expenditures, and then based on some of this high-level uh, analysis, what the model is telling us as far as output right now. Uh, before I get into some of the specifics on that, I do want to stress that this is a, a model that's geared uh, exclusively at the general fund uh, right now. And the reason is that the general fund is your largest fund. Uh, it's your fund that has the most diverse services in it. Multiple city departments are funded from this resource. And it's also the one that experiences the most volatility year to year. Uh, lots of different revenue streams come in, lots of different things that impact those revenue streams. Uh, and so this is the one that we really try to have um, the best understanding of so that we can uh, make those uh, assumptions um, a little less uh, the guesswork and a little bit more scientific. Um, the assumptions that we have in here are very conservative. Um, we tried to be pragmatic about this without being overly pessimistic or overly optimistic about our situation and really try to use that we have historical trends to inform and guide uh, where we're, we're going with this. 
Um, we are really trying to achieve structural balance in the journal fund. Um, that's only important, but it's also a mandate from the state constitution and from the uh, city charter that we have a balanced budget every year. Okay, hold up. <coughs> okay, before I go any further, I wanna stay real quick uh, as city manager. Um, really apologize for the technical difficulties we're experiencing tonight for the folks who are trying to watch online and for you as a council trying to see these presentations um, there's several um, challenges going with our system this evening behind the scenes um, we didn't plan to have our public information officer power walking across the floor tonight or people dragging cords so uh, i apologize for that i know the council's made some pretty significant upgrades uh, financial investments in this and hopefully those are going to pay off in the very near term so i apologize for the uh, disruptive presentations you've had this evening um, but back to this presentation uh, before you tonight um, I also want you to know that throughout the fiscal year we'll update the information in this model uh, we'll put new data as we get it in here about our revenues as new information comes in about our expenditures so this is something that will be uploaded and, and updated monthly uh, and that information provided to you so that you can have better long-term um, information in the short term about where our finances are headed Okay, so let's talk quickly about some of our major revenues, uh, again, in the general fund. And there are three primary uh, revenue streams that really make up the bulk of the general fund. While all of these are important, really gonna focus on three of these this evening because they represent well over 60% of the revenue that comes into the general fund. Um, the pilot, uh, which we'll get into, represents the payment in lieu of taxes that come from our uh, utility funds. Um, our sales taxes, which come from our, our brick and mortar sales within the city of Independence, uh, and then our franchise fees. Uh, and you've heard from about a lot of these tonight. You heard Mr. Mayfield speak about um, the online sales tax. You've heard um, us speak about the franchise fees in the legislative presentation. So you can see how uh, these are very important and why we make these legislative priorities uh, as well. I'm gonna quickly talk about our property tax. Um, our property tax um, has been a big subject of conversation the last few years, had a lot of volatility there. You can see in 2019, uh, there was a big spike. This is when the county came in and did their uh, new assessments and that number jumped substantially. And then you can see this past year, that number rolled back down as the county uh, went through their appeal process. Um, we do have some mechanisms in place to try to uh, stabilize this, the, the recoupment, um, tool that the, the state has given us. But again, this is one we're carefully monitoring as the county continues um, to cull through the number of outstanding appeals. Um, so you can see we've tried to forecast a very level uh, growth in this for the next several years, um, anticipating that that's probably going to be again uh, somewhat volatile and we're edging on the side of caution here. I want to spend a few minutes then talking to you as well about our sales tax. Um, again, the council will recall that we budgeted our sales tax revenues um, to be down as a result of COVID this year. Um, this has been a um, very trying time for us to try to forecast these revenues because of the volatility there. Um, thus far this year, um, we just got some new data in today. Um, our sales taxes are about 9% above uh, where we were this time last year, uh, but I would give a very big caution to that. And the first caution I would give to that is we did a little uh, peeling back on the data there, and that as of uh, the end of September of this year, the number of small businesses, and we just heard from our EDC, but the number of small businesses that are uh, open has decreased by almost 16% uh, in the Kansas City metropolitan area compared to January of this year. So. In about 10 months time, we've seen a drop in 16% in our uh, small businesses in the city. Second caveat that I would give to you, um, as of the end of October of this year, the total spending, total spending by all consumers uh, has decreased by nearly 30% compared to the beginning of this year. Um, we've seen substantial decreases in retail, which has had a 30% decline. Restaurants have had a 35% decline. Uh, and the hardest hit, entertainment and recreation um, vendors have had an 81% decrease. Um, so while I am pleased to report that right now, as of this point this year, we've seen a 9% increase in our sales tax revenue. I think the volatility still remains. 
uh, and that's one that we're proceeding with caution on. I'd also mention that the use tax waterfall um, is something that we're closely monitoring. As the council will recall, uh, the use tax, once it fully funds the animal shelter and the hiring of 30 uh, uh, new officers, the salary and benefits for those 30 new officers, uh, that would waterfall then to its respective sales tax source. Um, again, data that we just got in today, um, year to date, we've collected $2.8 million in our use tax. That's a monthly average of about $311,000, which puts us on course to collect about $3.7 million uh, for the fiscal year. The use tax for, uh, was waterfall at $3.75 million, so we're getting very close to that point where we could begin to anticipate um, that waterfalling. If Wayfair legislation were to be enacted, we would shoot well past that. So that's something. Mr. City Manager. Yes, ma'am. 16% small businesses in mm -hmm. the metro area have closed, Correct. did you say? Correct. In or Kansas, is that in independence? Yeah, they, they, the data that we get is um, grouped at the metro level. So that's um, all of Kansas City, Missouri, um, is metropolitan there any way area. Can we find out about independence or is that just a nightmare? To we'll try to dig that. It gets a okay. little less reliable on the data once you try to uh, get a little more granular, but we'll try to do that for you. Okay, Absolutely. Thanks. Okay. Um, again, our pilots is a, a important revenue source to us. This is again our payment in lieu of taxes uh, from the utilities. Um, we're forecasting right now a very stable resource um, revenue stream, I should say, from this um, particular source. Um, right now, the council will recall we have um, a rate moratorium for the Independence Power and Light, um, and both water and um, sewer are very financially uh, stable right now as well so we are not anticipating any new rate increases at this time so again you look at the bars visually there um, the forecast assumption for our five-year model is showing that to be uh, relatively flat and stable and utility franchise fees this is again the item that mr mayfield just spoke to you about as part of our legislative agenda it's one that we are trying to protect but consumer trends are showing us that this is probably a declining and decaying revenue stream for us um, Lots of volatility here, um, but in a couple of areas, um, gas, this is the Spire um, uh, or MGE, that is wholly and entirely dependent upon weather. So if we have mild winters, people don't need to run their furnace as much and use natural gas. And, and then again, the franchise fee from there would be less. Uh, both telephone and cable, we're seeing people migrate, consumers migrate away from that in favor of streaming s services uh, for television entertainment and also for cell phone instead of a landline. So both of those resources are declining. Uh, electricity franchise fee, this is the portions of the community that are serviced by K Kansas City Power and Light. That is primarily the Lake City Army Ammunition Plant. Um, but again, that is dependent on productivity out there, also somewhat dependent on weather and uh, any of the energy efficiency measures uh, that they take out there as well. So flipping now to the expenditure side, uh, as you can see, uh, expenditures in our general fund are almost entirely driven by our salary and benefit costs. Um, the model has a couple of assumptions built into it here that I want to highlight for you. This assumes a 2% uh, cost increase for our non-represented employees. And the reason I put 2% in there is that is my recommendation of the minimum amount that we need to be budgeting for uh, over the next several years if we want to um, maintain a, a, and recruit a competitive workforce. Saw again some data that came out very recently from a salary survey through the Mid-America Regional Council. This is the Regional Council of Governments for the nine county area. They surveyed 29 different cities and asked them what they were planning to do as far as wage increases in the next fiscal year. Um, of those 29 respondents, 79% are planning to give raises of at least 2% uh, or more. Um, there were only uh, a few respondents who were planning to give less than 2%. Um, so again, if we want to think of our peers uh, and our competition being primarily here within this region, that 2% needs to be the minimum baseline that we're trying to get to every year. And that's why I built that into the forecast so that we can try to accommodate that. Is that 82% up there, does that include the retirees too? Is that just? Yeah, that is all of the <clears throat> insurance costs, all of that as well. Uh huh. So we also then have um, the 1% cost built in for 
just general operating expenses, cost of doing business, um, raises in um, you know, consumer price index, things like that. Okay, so here's the moneymaker slide. This is the, what the five-year model is telling you. The dashed red line is that 16% reserve balance target that through the council's adopted financial policies we are trying to uh, get the general fund to. Uh, you can see that we are um, below that right now, but certainly working to try to get there um, over uh, the next several of years. In order to do that, um, we're going to have to continue to be very responsible with our expenditures uh, while also, you know, not being penny wise and pound foolish. I don't believe we can necessarily cut our way to prosperity. That leads me to say that we need to continue to work on our revenue picture, um, opportunities to bring in additional businesses, to help raise the median income, all the things you've heard from the prior speakers here uh, this evening. Um, right now, our fund balance, um, we are projecting that to um, raise this year from 5.3 million to 6.1, raise a little bit more in the out years, but then uh, as some of those cost increases come in and some of those traditional revenue streams continue to decline uh, without additional changes, you can tell where that fund balance number would start to, to decline. So that is the, the, the challenge that is before us, um, but this is now as we begin to start thinking about developing our submitted budget that we will bring to the council in May, this is the backdrop that we are working against uh, and the opportunities that we have before us. And Mr. Mayor Pro Tem and Council, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? I have one. Uh, Mr. Yes. City Manager, what, if, if the year ended today, we're, what, what kind of shortfall will we have? Right now, um, we, are, we are trending somewhat favorably because of that better than expected sales tax revenue number. Um, the budget that the council adopted this past June for the fiscal year that started July 1st had a $1.55 million contingency that we informally referred to as our COVID contingency. Um, right now, the biggest adversary, if you will, that I'm seeing is the cost of our health insurance plan. Um, there's, there's been some pretty substantial claims made against that this year. We're trying to monitor if that was sort of a one-time blip or if that was a trend that's coming towards us. So we might have to draw down against that 1.55 million to help um, prop up our um, stay well fund. But absent that, um, I see us um, adding to uh, the fund balance um, and finishing with a, a net gain this year as we stand here on November the 9th. Yeah. Did, are we accounting for the CARES Act money that's come through our city too? We are. Um, How much has that been? We received a total of uh, $6.95 million, 2.2 million of that was again used for the uh, utility assistance. Um, the balance of that we have been using for those unplanned, unbudgeted expenditures uh, like sick leave costs, quarantining costs for our workforce, uh, the technology upgrades that are coming. <laughs> um, so around $4 million would be a good number to say that we that is helping with our budgetary picture this year. So without that money, we would be we in would a be bad. Yes, yes, sir. We would be sunk. So we still have that twelve and a half million sitting in reserves. Is that is that right that we took that we um, approved as a loan or whatever oh. we called that before I arrived? Yeah. From so, IPO. Yeah. The um, we it was about twenty five million dollars. Um, the council passed an ordinance or a resolution of a few months ago that um, returned. Uh, that 12 and, a, 12 and a half of that, which was 50%, mm -hmm. said to hold on to the balance of that through the end of this calendar year and get a better snapshot of where we were at at the midpoint of the fiscal year. That's still sitting there. Um, the city has not drawn down on that uh, line of credit, if you will. Uh, and as again, as we stand here today, about 45 days to the end of the calendar year, I'm not anticipating making a recommendation to draw down upon that. So we'll be prepared to give it back come first of the year? That's going to, uh, absent um, the bottom just totally dropping out in the next 45 days, that's going to be my recommendation. That's good news. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. I have a question. Richard? Our financial policies, Mr. City Manager, says that if we don't see our making the um, target, we have to have a plan on in place 
uh, to make the target. And to me, that means we either have to cut our expenses or increase our revenue. Now, I can hope till the cows come home that I'm going to increase my revenue, but, but that's not a plan. Right. And so the only plan I see <coughs> is to cut expenses. Are we looking at anything to actually cut specific expenses according to our financial policies that we have to do in order to meet our target? And yeah. it's a hard question, I know, and I'm sure. not happy talking about it, right. um, but it has to be talked about. Yeah, here's the reality, that big bar behind me, and that's the 83% of your budget that is tied up in salary and benefit costs. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that when other organizations last spring were doing furloughs and, and layoffs, the city did not, and you know, I think that's very hard to come back from, and, and I'm pleased that we didn't. Um, we've tried to bring several recommendations the last few years to the council to shrink the organization, to um, combine departments, to look for those efficiencies. Um, I'm always evaluating the impact of those decisions to see where they're successful and, and where maybe we need to take another look. I think some cases it's worked, in other cases I think we need to continue to reassess those opportunities to have the best service delivery possible. But at the end of the day, I, the plan that I would recommend to the council is going to be how do we continue to grow the revenue um, because that we're getting, I know people are tired of hearing me say that, but we're getting to the point where we don't have rabbits to pull out of hats anymore. We don't have, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. we don't have many rabbits left to pull out of the hats anymore. And, and that's just a, a really sad reality that absent finding ways to continue growing revenue, there's not many other places to go. Other than cut expenses. And you can tell where our biggest expenses are. Can I ask a question off of, are, are you finished? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just a question. Off. I think, I think her uh, council member Delucci's concern is, is valid. I mean, we're still in a lockdown condition here, right? So during the pandemic, we were given six million where we're we going to find that next year because it looks like we're going to continue this course for a while how are we going to continue to grow revenue in a city that has been crippled economically yeah. i mean i i hope i hope you find a bigger hat <laughs> or more rabbits, no more rabbits yeah because yeah, yeah. we're, we're definitely going to be in a situation here yeah, we are. and we don't need to be addressing this when we're there no and council member, in the interest of full transparency, I think I ought to make sure, I, my mind gets locked into thinking about that 6.9 million of CARES Act funds. There were lots of places that CARES Act dollars got allocated. We received over, one, I think it was $1.2 million from the Kansas City Area Transit Authority mm -hmm. that saved our bacon saved on our the bus. transit. Otherwise, <coughs> the proposal was on the table to reduce that bus service. That was one-time money as well, too. Um, so. Yes, we are very grateful that we got that, but I don't think these one-time gimmicks are necessarily the structural balance this council is looking for. Well, and I appreciate your transparency on that. So, but I, I hope we can continue this discussion. Yes. And and when you find the rabbits in the hat, let us know. My pleasure. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. Go ahead. So, as Councilwoman DeLucy mentioned, you either cut revenue or we find. Uh, increased revenue. Well, we've had some some good policies, we've some good discussions with our EDC on on how we can help go from greenfield development to um, small business development. And that's going to be a key. Unfortunately, the the whole country slash world's in a lockdown. A lot of our uh, small business owners have made that decision to to shutter to to a large degree. That they follow the, the numbers that are trending nationally and regionally. That they've chose to, to do that for for their sa employee safety, for their customer safety, and for the fact that most people won't come out even if we were completely open. So there was a lot of discussion with that, but we're not going to be in this lockdown forever. Hopefully, knock on wood. Um, so how do we come out of it stronger, more viable, and ready to take in City of Independence? We have the greenfield development possible. It's out there. JD and Jody, the group here working on that to bring that in. Other council members are bringing that in. 
What else do we have here to, that can help increase the revenue? We have a, a, a great historic town, a great historic revenue stream that we can bring tourism in here, bring uh, uh, regional uh, individuals that will come here and stay here. Inglewood, I believe they're gonna do a, a presentation the first part of December. Uh, Michael Baxter with Inglewood Arts talking about how they are moving forward in Inglewood despite the COVID and their fundraising efforts and when they get that open, what type of vitality that will bring. Met with JD, we went to Pedro and talked to them how we can work with the capital improvement projects that are moving forward on 25 Highway to help develop that. These are more further out into the future, but these are tax revenue streams. This is how we increase our, our tax revenue by enhancing our square, bringing the tourism into our town by having a place ready to go when we are opened up that we can have that destination of, uh, of pride and be able to bring that in. The uh, uh, Truman Library just finished up or, or finishing up a $32 million um, redevelopment of, of their facility. That's gonna bring in a ton of people in here. So tourism is where we need to begin to focus what we have here uh, uh, now. That's a good start wafer legislation that we were talking about that has got to get pushed through jeff city and i would open up my time and ability to to get into what in front of a committee down there in jeff city to speak in favor for that because that's where our our future of our um, sales tax revenue is coming from the old days when i was on the council in 96 that's gone we're into the future now here with with internet sales tax so that's the future i'd be more than happy to speak <coughs> in favor of uh, in jeff city to help get that pushed through wherever you think i need to be fit so we've got to be able to think cautiously but we've got to be able to think out of the box how we can we can increase these these revenue dollars and also when the opportunity comes when we have development that we can leverage those dollars that we're not spending money out of our uh, general revenue sources as, as you can see here but there's federal dollars that we can leverage if we can get twice the much money three times as much money for every dollar we put in we need to grab that i mean so there's other ways that we can tackle this animal and i appreciate your creativity and I, again thanks to the edc for for their future work and what they're looking to try to help increase those revenues so thank you yeah and we look forward to continuing to, to work with you I, I i'll wrap it up by saying this if it's okay real quick we we've done a lot all right, I'm really proud of being able to work with this council to you know, consolidate our services, look for those opportunities to get efficient, uh, to partner with um, good people like Mr. Sorensen to help address our long-term uh, insurance obligations. That's when I say the rabbit's out of hat. Those are the changes that we've made. That, that, but the reality is you know, when we walk out of here tonight, we walk into a zip code where the median household income is $37,000 and 21% of the people live below the federal poverty line. So the things you've talked about tonight, like workforce training and tourism and, 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 and the opportunities to have better housing quality, those are the things that long-term are gonna be the shot in the arm um, because I don't think continuing to cut exclusively is going to be in the best interest of raising all those ships. So we look forward to bringing that plan to you and working with you over the next several months and years to, to do that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, if it's okay, I'll go ahead and introduce the last uh, presentation from right here. Uh, and that is none other than Tom Scannell, uh, who's here to speak on the ordinance that had your first reading last Monday night, have a second reading next Monday night, the abandoned registry program, um, I'll let Tom give a quick overview of that. Um, Mr. Scannell. I'm a little bit shorter than Zach. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and members of, of the council. As Zach said, my name is Tom Scannell and I'm the Community Development Director. And um, giving you a presentation on the vacant structure uh, registry maintenance program. So, but, but first I wanna give you an, an overview of some of our existing codes and, and programs that we have that uh, is looking to ad address uh, blight, code, code I issues, and also the quality of life. As many of, of you know, we have a property maintenance code. This is dealing with the tall grass, weeds, uh, trash, uh, cars parked in the grass, NOVs, which is non-operable vehicles. We also have our, our dangerous building code and our unsafe building code. And those are um, 
buildings at, uh, as, as the dangerous name leads to, it's a structure that uh, is a dangerous situation for uh, public health uh, and the unsafe building. That is dealing with uh, uh, buildings that tend to have uh, clutter and unsafe conditions. And a few years ago, back in 2016, uh, the city ad adopted the Rental Ready Program. That is uh, a, a program getting the rental properties uh, registered and having those uh, <coughs> units inspected every other year. Uh, so I want to sh show this chart here. This chart shows uh, something that we are concerned about. So, as, so the top line, the blue line, is the uh, number of violations that we receive each month. So during our busy s season, you, you can see we kind of peak out. And then in, as it cools down in, in September and October, our numbers start to go down. The red line is the abatements that have been, been ordered. Typically, this would, this would follow our uh, violation line. But as you can see, it continues to go, to go up. So that is one concern. This chart here uh, kind of shows our, our dangerous building trends. Uh, the top line, the blue line, is the number of dangerous building cases that we have right now. Uh, just to let you know, in September, uh, which was the, the last time that we completed our monthly report, we had 220 dangerous building ca cases. Compare that to 2019, we had 135 dangerous building cases. So you kind of see that uh, our code enforcement activity and our dangerous building trends uh, are kind of going in the wrong direction. A few other trends that we are seeing is, um, you know, so I kind of talked about the uh, dangerous buildings and unsafe buildings. Those we know about. The other ones that we run into to issues with are those, those vacant residential and commercial bu buildings that we get the occasional com complaint on, but we don't really have uh, but they don't meet the unsafe or the dangerous uh, criteria, so we so they cannot be uh, classified as as such. We have also seen this year uh, the number of pro property owners who are basically relying on on the city to be their uh, landscaper. Uh, they found that uh, having the the neighbors call in three, four, five times a year. And the city go out and, and abate the situation, meaning mow the grass, pick up the trash, is far cheaper than having uh, them have a property manager or someone or a, a company providing that service. And finally, another trend that, we, that we've seen is uh, more and more investors looking at residential properties who have open code violations for longer than, than six months. That's a concern to us. Um, so what are some issues tied to vacant structures? Well, first off, they're unsightly and they have a negative impact on the community. Uh, they also negatively affect the property values where those are, are located uh, in, in neighborhoods along the corridors. Uh, they can also be places where we have in infestations of rodents and insects. Um, but also during the winter months, the, uh, they provide shelter to individuals who are uh, either up to no good or don't have shelter. Uh, and then during the, the colder months, fires tend, or they start a, a fire and then there, there's a fire at that structure. So that creates another uh, need for, for service. So some of the challenges that that, that we have, uh, as the city manager has mentioned, we have limited resources to deal with these issues. We have limited amount of money to abate these, these properties, and we have limited amount of money to demolish these, these structures. Uh, we're using our legal mechanisms, but these have been uh, too slow or ineffective to get the desired outcome. We want to see these, these buildings occupied and vibrant. Uh, although we have we have had a, a few uh, successes along the way where we've been able to uh, get those those vacant buildings uh, back into to good use, but our our 
number of properties that we need to address keeps increasing. So as a result, uh, uh, staff had looked at what other, what other cities are, are doing to address this, this situation and is proposing the vacant structure and registry pro program. And this is a program that would apply to residential, multifamily, <coughs> commercial office, and industrial structures. Um, the way that this program is, is tailored is any unsafe or dangerous building would automatically apply. They're gonna have to, to register their, um, their structure into this, this program. Uh, multifamily residential, uh, where more than 80% of the units are un unoccupied. Uh, they would have to, to register their, their structures. Uh, commercial office or industrial with more than 50% of their, their space that's un unoccupied. They would have to, to register. And as well as any residential structure that hasn't been occupied uh, longer than uh, six months. So registration is the first component of this, this program. Uh, with this, we are getting the contact information of all the, the owners associated with the property. Uh, but most importantly, uh, we are getting the contact information for a local representative within 50, 50 miles of independence. Uh, as part of that registration, we are getting a, a plan that includes the, the timeline for regular maintenance, um, how they intend to keep uh, the building wet, weather tight and keep people out of there. Uh, we're also getting a list of authorized individuals who can be present in that, that building. Uh, and imp importantly, and this is important to the police department, is that uh, we're getting that, that MOU that allows the police to uh, arrest anyone who is not authorized uh, to be in that, that building. The registration, there is a, a registration fee. Uh, it's kind of a tiered structure. Uh, so for single family and, and duplexes, it's uh, 350 for every six months and that increases uh, up to $500 after the structure has been vacant for two years. And then af after three years, it starts to go monthly. Uh, multifamily and commercial um, starts at $500 every six months and then goes up from, from there. Um, so what's gonna happen as part of this, this program is there will be regular proactive in inspections of these properties to ensure compliance with the regulations. And that's the second component of this, this program. Um, so, properties have to comply with our with our property maintenance code peeling paint uh, weeds uh, non-operable vehicles all of those things that is governed by the property maintenance code they have to abide by by that if there's dead landscaping on the uh, property they have to re replace that in accordance with the UDO uh, if they happen to have any any dumpsters or signage they either have to uh, well, they'll have to, to remove the uh, dumpster or, or screen that per our, our ordinances. Signs, they have to, to remove those. And Im importantly, what, uh, what we want to ensure is that they keep all fire, fire protection systems intact. And this is really gonna be on the uh, commercial side, but without those, uh, if there does happen, if someone does get in, in there and there is a, a fire, without having that fire protection system, the building could, could be lost to a, a, a fire. Um, also, uh, the building has to be maintained in a weather tight and secure manner. So what this means is uh, they, they board that up, broken windows are replaced. Uh, the ordinance does go, go in, into uh, talking about that after, <coughs> after the doors and windows are boarded up for, for six months, they have to replace those. They cannot just keep those, those, those boarded up. Lastly, um, this ordinance still allows us to um, pursue any ab abatement, so whether that's uh, tall grass, weeds, trash, or if we need to demolish the, 
the building, we still reserve the right to, to, to do that. Um, on, the, on the good case where the, the building is going to be um, reused, which is our goal, uh, if they haven't paid any, any fees or fines or anything thing like that, all those have to be, be paid before a building permit is, is issued or before they, uh, they occupy that structure. And uh, any fee that is not paid, this ordinance does give us the ability to uh, put a lien on that, that property, uh, much like what we do for dangerous buildings and um, our co-enforcement abatements. So that's kind of an overview of the, the program, and I'm available for any questions. Any questions? I do. Tom, I just wonder if the city has ever looked at actually suing the owner of the property versus putting a lien against the property. For example, when we tear down a house of, and it costs us eight or $10,000, as I understand it, we, we pay for that and we have a lien on the property and then you know, the, the property goes on over to the land trust mm -hmm. and the land trust tries to dump it and they finally get a buyer at the courthouse steps and the buyer is willing to pay $2,000 but only so long as we forgive the lien. And as a result, we never get paid. And so I was just so curious because I would think that we could do some kind of program where we actually sue the owner of the property for money to get his money to tear down that property. Is that at all possible or does that violate some kind of statute that I don't know about? If anybody can answer that. Um, I know one city to our west is able to do that, Councilwoman. I think we probably need to check our statutory authority to make sure that we're on the same footing with them. Kansas City, is that who does it? That is correct. So. Um, and I think it is one of those wonky things where it, some of you may be familiar with state statute where it describes a city of a certain size with certain geographical features, but it's describing Kansas City. I, I need to double check this and I will with Mr. Mayfield, um, the legislative authority, but I, that may be something we want to add to our legislative portfolio as well to make sure I we've got that I think that would be authority. money well spent. I really do. If you could report back to us in the next month or two, certainly, Mr. City Manager, because that to me is more effective than some of these other things we're looking at. Well, having practiced, Miss Councilwoman Delucy, having practiced some in lien enforcement and small lawsuits like this, there's definitely a cost benefit analysis that goes along with it because you can sue somebody all day long, but collectability uh, has become a real important part of whether or not you file suit. But certainly, so long as a municipality is allowed to do it or our municipality is it's an option and as long as we're talking about changing the rules i remember having a conversation tom with you a couple years ago and i was complaining about code enforcement and how long it seemed to take and how many times do people have to call et cetera, et cetera. and it was explained to me a few years ago that we have a timeline that like a person has grass that grows and it gets too long and so a neighbor complains, so we send out a letter and then we send a person out to look and then we send a notice out and then we finally mow it and then the grass grows again and it's not mowed and, and, and basically so much time passes that it's like it's a brand new code violation that, that we don't double up. Like yeah. to me, three times and you're out. I mean, we should really get heavy on those fines. And, is that simply a policy we have, or is that a law that we have to follow? That is a law that we have to, to follow, and it was, it was a 2016 with Senate Bill 5. Oh my that, goodness, that again. That's, that took that power away from us. We had wow. previously, we had that uh, three strikes, and we were out there immediately. Uh, but with Senate Bill 5, it, it, it mandates the uh, process, the due process that we have to follow, and then it it also ma mandates the maximum fine that the municipal court can charge for each one of those. And it's not until the fourth 
violation the four, fourth time before municipal court that it gets up to four hundred and fifty dollars okay which is a very slow and arduous process and we can't shorten the time between <coughs> the the hearing and things of that nature Un to unfortunately, move it. unfortunately we can't that is tied in that senate bill five thank you tom uh, city mr city manager i uh, really like this I've been after this for years. I can't stand when these people, uh, the Wendy's and et cetera, just leave in vacant building for years and years. And I hope sure. that we can get some more teeth in this. I know we have a lot of buildings out south here that we've been putting up with for years and maybe they'll react now, uh, hopefully. I think what this gives us is another tool in the t toolbox and hopefully the, the financial fees of, of this will get people to uh, see that hey i need to do something with this i cannot just sit on on this and 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 take the take the write off i need to do something with this yeah there's a few houses over here that i've complained about that's had a tarp they change out the tarp instead of the roof and it's been going on for about 25 years but uh, hopefully this will get some attention indeed <laughs> i agree i think it's it's time we send a message uh it's that's good. Yep. That's it. That'll move us to uh, staff reports. Madam City Clerk. Thank you. Uh, Tourism Commission has a vacancy recommendation has been made to appoint Nancy Kerr to the Tourism Commission. If there's no objections, we'll get a resolution added at the next meeting. Go ahead. Go to the next one. Okay. Public Safety Sales Tax Oversight Committee has a vacancy recommendation has been made to appoint Aaron Boatwright. This is an individual council appointment by Council Member DeLucy. If there's no objections, we'll get a resolution added to the next regular meeting. No objections. Thank you. And then finally, staff is looking um, at seeking direction from the council regarding scheduling boards and commissions. Due to the pandemic, we've had a lot of scheduling issues. So what we're looking to do is to schedule these boards and commissions meetings for the next six months in order to get everything streamlined. So if there's no objections, my department will start working on that immediately. No objections. Thank you. Anything else? Meetings adjourned. <laughs>